in the third week of March, everything suddenly changed. And I, I don't know if it's a few. You, we were all kind of wandering along fairly, fairly kind of normally. Hurtling towards Easter. Hurtling towards Easter. Every week of Easter. And then uh, suddenly, within a week, um, church was closed and um, the whole programme was suddenly moved online. What I thought to do is just now talk um, uh, with Michael and also with um, Gabby, just a little bit about what that, um, what that online programme meant. And actually some of the benefits from music making in church, as well as some of the real kind of challenges with that. Um, maybe if we just start with, um, with Gabriella, do you want to talk about, a little bit about the, um, um, the recording of hymns remotely? When we were all in lockdown, we teamed up with C of E, a church near you resource, and recorded five hymns a week, all remotely. And how this worked was using the Choral Scholars programme. Um, so those 10 singers, we'd have an organist record the backing track, that would get sent to me and I would sing it and conduct it at the same time. That would get sent round to our singers who would then record their own tracks along to my singing so it was in time, send it back to me or Andrew and we'd stitch it together. Um, so it was quite a process. But I think what we would learn from that was how central to worship hymn singing is. You know, these hymns were downloaded, was it 40? I, I can't remember the figure, Andrew, but it was an incredible number of times. It's just, uh, I think, I think this week it's hit two hundred thousand downloads. Two hundred thousand downloads. Yeah. And um, you know, I actually heard people who I didn't know through St Martin's, just friends of friends, saying, "Oh, it's fantastic! My grandmother's church have got this resource, and they've they've got these amazing professionally recorded hymns." And oh, that was our educational program. That was the choral scholars. Um, so we've really learned how essential hymn singing is, and I think it's also quite essential for confidence building. Um, I also run some community choirs outside of St. Martin's that aren't attached to any church. Um, but I've really realized through my interactions with them that singing along to people who sing confidently really boosts their confidence to then do it without those people, you know? Um, so it makes me think going forward about the potential uses of resources of, of like bits of audio, you know, we have all the technology to help community singers and voluntary singers um, if, if they lack in confidence. And obviously along the voluntary church singing spectrum, you have everything from quasi-professional sounding amateur to not so, so confident volunteer or community choir singer. And we really want, I think, especially for those community choir singers who perhaps aren't so confident, I think these resources could be a fantastic way in. And I think what we found was really interesting in terms of this kind of um, virtual choir recording and, and really getting to rhythm because I think we we did about a hundred different virtual choir recordings through lockdown um, and we all got slightly delirious by the end of this um, but actually the kind of range of repertoire so um, you know alongside the hymns that that Gabriella's talked about um, we did some really beautiful um, pieces with our with our choir at Martin Field so as as, as Gabby said um, we've got our choir St Martin Fields which are really at the kind of top ends of, of voluntary music making and then we have our community choir which which really kind of encapsulates anybody in the congregation who's, who'd, who'd like to sing and I remember we did an absolutely beautiful um, Palestrina secret service, the unaccompanied motet which I thought was going to be absolutely impossible to to work out how to do that with everybody singing in their and recording in their living rooms but you could really feel the emotion in, in, in the performance. Gabby, do you want to say something about what, what a Zoom rehearsal is like and what, what the pitfalls, but what the benefits are? So if I'm thinking about the community music making I do outside of St. Martin's, um, I work with the Cares Family Charity, which is a charity combating loneliness across the nation. And we did some Zoom online workshops and also with a local community choir, the Kingston Singers. And a lot of the reasons that people, I think, join community choirs, be that in, a ch in the church setting, as we're discussing or not, is because of the sensation of singing together. So obviously you can't have that on Zoom and that is massively compromised. However, I think there were some benefits. So the mute function actually really empowered some people to sing like no one was listening because no one was listening, you know? And when you are doing a rehearsal on Zoom, you can't have everyone unmuted because it's complete chaos because everyone has a different bandwidth and there's the latency issues. So how it worked, when I did online community singing was we'd learn a song, everyone would be on mute and they'd sing along to me at the piano singing it. So, and when they reported back and I'm still going with the Cares family, we're still doing these Zoom ones, even though we're sort of out of lockdown. 
And the report back is that actually even just singing along with one person is, it, it still gives them the same sensation of togetherness and helps them feel more confident. And it makes me think about as directors um, in community music making, we could do better to sing a lot ourselves actually um, and how much it helps to have confident voices to sing along to. Um, one other Zoom thing I did over the lockdown was with the National Youth Choir of Great Britain, the training choir, and it was 130 children, 15 to 18, all of whom were excellent musicians and incredibly enthusiastic. And I was just saying to Andrew and Michael, it makes me think there's all these amazing voices, potential people who want experience in leadership. And is there any way of using young people to bring into community choir groups, be that creating positions as um, a voluntary choir leader or choir assistant that would both imbue them with experience, which would be fantastic for them and would be fantastic for the musicians and also do the other thing which community groups I think do when they're at their best, which is bridge generational gaps um, as part of the worship. So I really, I really interested in using youth music and excellent youth musicians and giving them experience and helping community music that way. So Michael, what, tell me about some of the work that you did during lockdown. Well, we, didn't, we did a few hymns, nothing like <laughs> on the scale of St. Martin's. And normally with just one person or two people singing, sometimes multi-tracked, but not too many vocal tracks to mix. But we also included instruments. We included um, trumpet and trombone and cello and violin and flute, um, which we never do in hymns as a, mm. a normal thing. And I think we should start doing that a lot more <laughs> because I think people liked it. It's another thing that like having someone singing that's confident, having someone playing that's confident, mm. that isn't necessarily the organ or the piano, mm. that's just a different color, that's a, maybe a more encouraging color. Mm. Um, so we did that, we did some choral items, um, which is tricky. Yeah, sure, it's, <laughs> it's difficult. Um, but again, using the instruments as well, it, it, it gave everything a, a new dimension mm. um, of interest and, and encouragement. Mm. Um, and how that's translated, maybe I'm jumping the gun here, into now we've got services in, in the flesh. In, we've been in the courtyard at St. James's down the road outside for five Sundays. And of course the congregation are still not allowed to sing. Mm. But you can have a group of singers now singing. But we've been doing the, doing the hymns with all the congregation being encouraged to hum, to hum along with the hymns. Some people ignore the instruction, they just sing anyway. <laughs> um, but basically the, the humming sound is something really marvelous. And we did a few Teze chants like that as well. Mm. And people were getting quite adventurous with the humming because you don't just have to hum the tune, you can hum at any note that fits. And there was this sort of marvelous bed of rich sound coming from all over the congregation, the socially distanced congregation. Mm. So that is something else that we'd never thought of doing before. So you can have a, a, a group of singers singing the piece and everyone else humming along. And then they're, they're not just like an audience, they're actually mm. an active part of the, of the proceedings. Mm. Um, in the same way that, um, of course, it, when the services were all on lockdown, the, the readings and the intercessions were pre-recorded from different members of the community and fed into the service. We've still got that going. Now we're in the, in the flesh. We're still broadcasting the service on YouTube. Um, and we still have readings and intercessions fed in from people that mm. aren't able to come in. We're mixing and matching now. Yeah. And I think that's an important part of, of moving forward. Now. Mm. People have kind of, you know, busy lives. They can't always commit to every week singing in a church or even, you know, kind of being in the congregation. And what we found during lockdown and actually even now is actually it's a, it's a way of kind of building a community that's wiser than the people who can just get into the building. So for example, 
one of our um, St. Martin's Voices moved to Copenhagen in January. And we thought that, you know, we were going to see him kind of very, very occasionally in London. But actually, he ended up doing all of the um, remote recordings. And it was a really good way of kind of keeping that community work really wi widely. Um, but also, it was a really interesting way of, of you know, be, being able to kind of do different things with different groups. So, you know, sometimes you might get kind of four singers and doing a bit of Anglican chant and a psalm. Other times, we might have had a worship song, which the Church of England wants to do, and then you do it with a soloist. Um, I remember there was one which I think, Gabriella, you did as a duet with somebody. Yes. Uh, it, was a, it was a Law to My Shepherd. Lord Shepherd. Um, and that kind of flexibility, I think, is a really, um, is a really interesting thing. We're now in this kind of slightly strange territory where um, socially distanced singing is, um, you know, uh, is becoming a kind of norm. Gabriella, how is it for you? When we got back to it, it was, I mean, it was fantastic to hear voices in a, a stone building again. It was very moving. Um, but obviously it, it's not without its challenges. You know, the first session back where I was conducting, I was very aware that there was some tentativity, you know, you put down the beat and everything happened a bit later. Um, so that's something I found it useful to be aware of. I, at first I thought, have I forgotten how to lead a choir? Um, but then realized, you know, actually everyone's two and a half meters away from each other there's not this confidence to breathe together and sing. So I think it requires of, of the directors of music to be even more encouraging. Um, and especially when the red light's on, you know, and you're recording. So I think actually going back to services where it's not, it's not always recording will be really brilliant for that as well, because it takes the pressure off a bit and, you know, it's, it's a live thing um, and part of the worship. So I think those are some of the challenges is the distance and the hesitancy that that engenders with, with the breathing and with the kind of not knowing am I singing with everyone else but it's also just been really amazing to come together again and as you say Andrew to be able to explore a variety of repertoire I feel like it's sort of broadened our horizons a little bit um, because nothing nothing is standard anymore in a way and um, so it's given us the freedom to you know if we had a smaller group at, you know this, this wasn't part of a service, but we did a performance of the Valley Gloria a concert and we did the arrangement for just upper voices. Partially because of the social distancing, we need a smaller group, but it's actually a great op opportunity if you can only get three people two and a half meters away in church to explore new music. Um, and I think a lot of the upper voices, having services that are just upper voices or just lower voices, the voices appreciate it too. And say, oh, it's actually really interesting to sing with people who sing around the same pitch as me and it makes the harmony speak in a different way so yeah i think it's an opportunity for variety that's for sure mm -hmm.